I actually would like to start because um, to this time also introduce the person who's doing the introduction because this is one of the co-organizers, Ronson Salem, um, a colleague from the Open University who hasn't kind of probably featured enough in this conference, but he was very instrumental in bringing this together. Uh, so I think we should also show our appreciation to Ronson for doing such a great job. Thank you very much, Petra. Uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing the keynote speaker for our conference, Gary Bourne. I will try my best to very briefly summarize his achievements and, and, and his repertoire, but I don't think I can do enough justice uh, to him. So to start, Gary Bourne is the chair of the International Arbitration Practice Group at Wilmer Cutler Pickering Hale and Door LLP and is widely regarded as the world's preeminent authority on international commercial arbitration and international litigation. It is the case that in the legal profession, only elite practitioners can unite both their first competitors and clients in praise of their services and, and their expertise. Mr. Bourne is one of this elite group. He has been described as awesome, force of nature, stellar, a, a powerful advocate, extremely talented, and my favorite, utterly phenomenal in chambers and other publications by both his clients and competitors. He's one of only two lawyers in the world, and the only lawyer in London, as far as I'm aware, to have received global, global starred status in the Chamber's rankings for international arbitration. As it regards international litigation, he has particular experience in the fields of conflict of laws and international ju judicial cooperation. And also, you know, in his time, he also serves as an expert witness on aspects of US private international law in foreign proceedings. Now, for most of us in our studies, and for those of you in practice, uh, whether this be in law or in some other discipline, there is always a preferred text that we will go to uh, to find answers to our questions or to point us in the right direction for any of our queries. When I studied international commercial arbitration, my classmates and I had a 3,000 page, two volume, what we call the Bible for that subject. It was called International Commercial Arbitration and it was written by Mr. Bourne. With its updated form now to 4,000 words and a very nice three volumes, it still remains a leading treatise, a treatise in the field. Mr. Bourne thinks very deeply about the consequences and structures and also the implications of choices in international litigation. He works to raise awareness among small states of the different forms of dispute resolution and to explore particular international arbitration mechanisms. He has led workshops for representatives of the Pacific Island states to address whether, how, and why to ratify the New York Convention and whether to adapt their laws to the ancestral model law on international commercial arbitration. Today, he's speaking to us about law for small states in international commercial arbitration. Ladies and gentlemen, Join me in a round of applause to welcome Mr. Gary Bourne. Thank you for that um, introduction. It's one of those introductions where you'd rather just um, stay, stay and listen instead of actually having, having to talk. I, I appreciate it very much. It was, it was an honor to, to hear that. It's also um, an honor to, to have the opportunity to address all of you. I know that you have, whether you're um, practitioners or representatives of, of states, you have uh, many important things to do, and I appreciate your taking the time both to, to come here to, to Petra's conference, um, if I can call it that, um, and also to, to listen to me. Um, I haven't exactly figured out what I'm going to say, though. <laughs> 
Um, so I'm going to try and explore it as as we move along. I, I guess what I what I should do is is start where, in a sense, we left off in in Tonga, which is addressing the the best way, or at least a good way, for states and in, in particular small states to provide for dispute resolution in international business transactions. Why, why should states want, want to do this? They should want to do this because at the end of the day, the, the thing that, that pays the bills, generates the taxes, creates the jobs, creates the future for the citizens of, of states and, and small states in particular is business. Um, if you don't have um, productive economic enterprises, you don't have jobs, you don't have taxes and the revenues that that produces for roads and schools and clean water, and you don't have a future for, for your children. And so states around the world, large and small for the most part, have given lots of thought over the last hundred years, over the last century, half century, to how to provide a mechanism for resolving international commercial disputes. If you don't have a mechanism, if you don't have the infrastructure for resolving international commercial disputes, then businessmen and businesswomen won't enter into contracts in the first place and they won't build factories and they won't use those factories to, to produce things. And as a consequence, states, again, both, both large and, and small, have adopted two key instruments. There, there are certainly others that, that um, are, are worthy of mention if, if we had more time, but, but two key instruments to provide what I would call the infrastructure for international commercial dispute resolution. And those two instruments are firstly, and they're both adopted under the, the auspices of, of the United Nations in, in one form or another. And the first is the United Nations Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of, of Foreign Arbitral Awards, also known after the place where it was negotiated, the New York Convention, which in many ways is a global constitution for international commercial arbitration and which, thinking back to the, to the panel we just heard from, provides a, a, if I can put it this way, supremely elegant and supremely effective means of international dispute resolution. It, it obviates the need for a complicated institutional apparatus. It obviates the need for continual political um, arm wrestling, something which small states in particular may not be so excited about, and instead provides, as I'll say in a few moments, a very simple and elegant means by which international commercial disputes can effectively be resolved. And then the second instrument, which I'd also like to say a few words about, is the UNCTRAL model law on international commercial arbitration, which on a national level accomplishes many of the same things that the New York Convention does. The, and, and it has, um, well, today the New York Convention has 156 contracting states around the world um, since it was negotiated in in 1958, the UNCTRAL model law, which was first adopted in, in 1985, has 100 or so um, adoptees, if I, if I can put it that way, uh, 100 or so jurisdictions which have adopted the model national legislative provisions of the, the model law as recommended by by UNCTRAL. And taken, and it's helpful to, to look at these two instruments, the New York Convention and the UNCTRAL model law together because they operate very much in tandem, they, they operate together. Broadly speaking, what, 
the New York Convention does is, is two things. Firstly, it guarantees the international enforceability and validity of international commercial arbitration agreements. In Article 2.1 and 2.3, and the New York Convention requires all 156 contracting states to recognize international commercial arbitration agreements and when an agreement applies to a dispute to refer the parties mandatorily to arbitration rather than hearing that dispute in local courts themselves. It provides a sort of global enforcement mechanism for international commercial arbitration agreements. And the second thing that the New York Convention does is the same thing in a sense for international arbitral awards in Articles 3, 4, and 5 of the New York Convention. The Convention requires that, again, all 156 contracting states recognize and enforce arbitral awards once they've been made in those arbitral proceedings to which the parties in their dispute have, have been referred. Now, both, both Article 2 and Article 5 are, are subject, both the obligations to recognize arbitration agreements and, and arbitral awards are subject to exceptions, but the important point is they're very narrowly drawn exceptions. Article 5's exceptions for non-recognition of an arbitral award apply basically only to um, absence of, of jurisdiction, the absence of a valid arbitration agreement, to serious procedural irregularities, either due process violations or failures to abide by the party's agreed arbitral procedure, or finally, issues of, of public policy, either non-arbitrability or violations of, of fundamental national public policy, a sort of escape valve, if, if you can put it that way, from the international obligations of the convention. And essentially the same sorts of exceptions apply to international commercial arbitration agreements. And taken together, what the convention and what the model law do jointly is to provide an international mechanism, a, a sort of constitutional charter for the international arbitration process. And the reason that this is so important is because absent that international legal regime, businesses have no effective way to resolve their international commercial disputes. There is no global treaty on the recognition of foreign judgments. There's no global treaty on the recognition of forum selection clauses. There's the thought of a treaty, the Hague Choice of Courts um, Convention, but thus far it has attracted little interest, and at least in our lifetimes, it won't be a serious competitor to the New York Convention. And what the convention, as implemented in, in national jurisdictions by the model law, accomplishes, therefore, is to provide businesses with an efficient and effective means of dispute resolution. When, when they conclude a contract, they can conclude that contract with the knowledge that if disputes arise, as almost inevitably they will, there will be a forum in which those disputes can be resolved and a forum which can produce a decision, an arbitral award, that is recognizable and enforceable around the world. And in turn, that gives businesses the confidence to enter into commercial relationships in the first instance. If they didn't have that means to resolve their contractual disputes, they wouldn't enter into their contracts in the first case, or at least they'd do so far less frequently and on far different terms. The convention provides a means of ensuring that states, both large states and small states, can reap the benefits of, of international commerce. And it does so, and this I think is of particular importance to small states, it does so in an exceptionally cost-efficient way. The states do not need to fund, do not need to create, do not need to maintain some sort of permanent court. States can rely on commercial parties to select arbitrators for particular cases who will then resolve disputes with the parties, not the states, paying for the dispute resolution mechanism. And the parties, not the states, in charge of the enforcement 
of the ultimate awards that are rendered in those proceedings. Arbitration also, although this is not a necessary aspect of either the New York Convention or, or the UNCTRAL model law, arbitration also provides businesses and states as well when they're involved in, in commercial disputes with a number of distinct advantages as compared to the alternatives. Because at the end of the day, everything in life is, is about competition and to decide whether or not the results produced by the New York Convention and the model law are actually good results, you need to compare it to what the alternatives are. And what arbitration allows parties, allows the commercial parties, state parties, to the arbitral process to do is to select arbitrators on the one hand and to design arbitral procedures on the other hand that are precisely tailored to their individual disputes. We all know that international commerce takes a myriad of different forms. It can be insurance contracts, it can be joint venture agreements, it can be telecommunications contracts, it can be construction deals, it can be any sort of, of commercial transaction. It can also, in, in today's global economy, involve any number of, of different parties from any number of different parts of the globe. And arbitration provides inherently the flexibility to adapt a tribunal choose specific individuals on a tribunal that are precisely suited to resolving a particular dispute. If you have a construction dispute in the South Pacific, you don't need to go to a standing court that inevitably would be full of Europeans. You can choose an arbitral tribunal that has people from the South Pacific and has people well experienced in international construction. That all provides parties greater certainty and predictability because you're not addressing, you're not attempting to present a case to a tribunal that actually knows very little about either the region or the language or the subject matter of the dispute. And businesses as well as states when they're engaged in arbitral proceedings make good use of their freedom to select arbitrators, to select arbitral tribunals for individual disputes in order precisely to ensure that the results in those disputes are more expert and more informed about the circumstances and nature of the parties and their dispute. At the same time, parties can design the arbitral procedures so that it's more efficient rather than less efficient. Instead of a one-size-fits-all, the ICJ rules of procedure, the rules of procedure of some Texas district court, one can design a set of arbitral procedures, for example, including a, a pre-arbitration mediation phase for example, including witness conferencing or site inspections or tribunal appointed experts in a way that greatly surpasses the flexibility that's available in, in national court proceedings. And in doing so, dispute resolution can, can be made much more efficient and, and much, much less costly. One frequently hears about arbitration that it's not cheaper and, and more expeditious, but actually it's it's longer and slower. Look like, for example, at the Yukos case. Look how long that took. Um, that, that sort of criticism, I think it's important to take with, with a number of grains or, or perhaps barrels of, of salt. Because as I mentioned some moments ago, international disputes come in a vast array of different, different types and, and sizes. It may, in a $50 billion case, make a whole lot of sense to have eight years of proceedings and to spend a whole lot of money on lawyers. If you're fighting, God forbid, over $50 billion, then you probably want a fair amount of attention to detail and a fair amount of process, due process, as opposed to rough justice and quick and dirty results. On the other hand, the vast majority of cases, in fact, don't have anything to do, don't have any resemblance at all in international arbitration to the sorts of things that you typically read about on the front page of the business section. The vast majority of international commercial disputes are actually sort of boring, sort of routine, sort of the sort of dispute that you want to get done quickly. And so just to take off my keynote speaker hat for one minute and put on my president of the Singapore International Arbitration Center hat for a moment, what arbitral institutions around the world have done is create mechanism for expedited procedures. Under, for example, the SEAC rules, if you have a dispute that involves less than, currently five, but 
in about two months, six million Singaporean dollars. It's about five million US dollars. The institution has the power to convert it to an expedited procedure, which means a sole arbitrator and six months from appointment of the tribunal to um, issuance of a final award. That reflects the parties, the commercial parties' desires in arbitration. And it achieves one of the basic purposes of, of the arbitral process. It provides a highly efficient means of dispute resolution in that, in six months, you get a final and binding award, fully recognizable and enforceable around the world because of the New York Convention that we talked about just a little bit ago, um, all at zero cost, effectively, to the state because the parties paid for the arbitrators and, and the arbitral institution. And as a consequence, and trying to wrap this up in, in a practical sense, 156 countries around the world have adopted the New York Convention. 100 company, countries have adopted, in some form, the UNCTRAL model law, precisely to provide a legal infrastructure to ensure that international commercial dispute resolution can proceed effectively and efficiently, and thereby encourage international trade and commerce. That's the reason for doing all of that. That's, in a sense, where we are today. We didn't get there automatically. It actually took some time from 1958 until today to end up with 156 contracting states. By 1970, there were only a few dozen contracting parties to the New York Convention. And it was only over time, on mature reflection, and based on experience that the New York Convention became essentially a global constitution for international arbitration. It was only over time that Steve Schwebel, the former president of the International Court of Justice, could say it works. It provides a highly effective means of international dispute resolution. And it's something that I would commend to both small states and large states that haven't yet adopted either of those two instruments. It's easy. A notice of, of accession to, to the convention is one page long. Um, it doesn't have to say very much. But it produces dramatically positive results for business because it enables citizens, nationals, companies of your respective states to participate fully in the global economy by providing a means of international dispute resolution for their contracting parties, an assurance that the agreements about dispute resolution that they've entered into will be honored and enforced, and that the results of those dispute resolution clauses will also be honored and enforced. That, in a sense, is, is, um, is the past. Um, and as I said, we're going to sort of explore this as, as I talk. Um, what about the future? What else could we do? Um, a, a further step, something that I think might be of um, considerable interest to small states around the world would be an idea that I suggested for large states as well. But it's even better, frankly, for, for small states. And this idea um, is, is based a little bit on plagiarism. It's based a little bit on plagiarizing the concept of bilateral investment treaties. And I sort of changed the middle, the middle word. It's not bilateral investment treaties that we ought to think about in the future. Instead, it's bilateral arbitration treaties. If the New York Convention is such a good thing, and I saw all of you nodding, so I think we've concluded now, along with the other 156 contracting states around the world, that the New York Convention is, is not just a good thing, but a really good thing. And we ought to have it. You want more, not less of it. If that's true, then how could we sort of take a step beyond that? How could we provide um, a better means of international commercial dispute resolution than what the convention already does. What we could do is think about, and because it's a new idea, we should, we should think hard about it. We shouldn't immediately leap to it. What we should do is think hard about bilateral arbitration treaties. They don't exist now, so we, we do have to think hard about it. We, we, they're not there automatically just to be picked up. Um, but we ought to think hard about the following concept. A bilateral arbitration treaty, like a bilateral investment treaty, would be entered into by 
by two states. And it would provide that the default means of international commercial disputes, the default means of resolution of international commercial disputes, would be international arbitration subject to the New York Convention. It would not, as it currently is, be litigation in national courts. What a bilateral arbitration treaty would do, say, between Tonga and New Zealand, just to pick two random states. What it would do would provide that if commercial disputes arose in the future between, on the one hand, New Zealand and the other hand, Tongo companies, those disputes wouldn't be resolved unless the parties otherwise agreed in national courts and instead would be resolved by international commercial arbitration. It would mean that New Zealand courts and the courts of Tonga would refer international commercial disputes between New Zealand and Tonga companies to arbitration rather than hear those disputes on the merits unless the parties otherwise agreed and would recognize and enforce on precisely the same terms as the New York Convention the awards resulting from those international arbitrations. The treaty is simple. It's been drafted. There actually is one. And it looks a lot, not surprisingly, like the New York Convention. The important difference between it and the New York Convention is that under a bilateral arbitration treaty, a BAT, arbitration would be the default means of dispute resolution. Unless parties mutually contracted out of arbitration, then where the BAT was applicable by virtue of their nationality and by virtue of the jurisdictional terms of the BAT, it would provide the default means of dispute resolution. Now, I often give this talk with a little title called Bits, Bats, and Butts, and I sort of start it with bits and say there's this automatic right to arbitrate, a standing offer to arbitrate, and it's a little bit like the concept of, of arbitration under a bilateral arbitration treaty. And then I talk about bats, and then I talk about butts. What are buts? Buts are the reasons that this idea of a bilateral arbitration treaty actually should give us pause, should give us great pause. We shouldn't do it, actually, when you think about it, when you think hard about it. What are the buts? What are the reasons that we should, we should hesitate when we think about this proposition for the future that I've, that I've suggested? The first but is, well, how would it work? I mean, when you have an, an international arbitration now under the New York Convention, you've got an arbitration agreement. It says parties agree to resolve all their disputes under Singapore International Arbitration Center arbitration with the seat in Kuala Lumpur or, or wherever, and the language of the arbitration shall be English or Arabic or, or who knows what. And you've got a procedure um, for, for choosing the tribunal. In a bilateral arbitration treaty, if you don't have, if it's the default mechanism, if by definition it only applies when you don't have an arbitration agreement, how do you have an arbitral procedure? How do you, how do you, know, um, how do you know how to conduct the arbitration? That, that actually is not much of a but, um, if I can put it that way, because the bilateral arbitration treaty would have in it, embedded in it, a procedure. And the most obvious procedure to adopt is the most universal procedure that exists, the UNCTRAL arbitration rules. And lots of arbitration clauses that are enforced every day and that produce perfectly good arbitral proceedings and perfectly good arbitral awards every day have nothing in them but a reference to the UNCTRAL arbitration rules. Those rules adopted by UNCTRAL, just like the model law was adopted by UNCTRAL, contain within them mechanisms for selecting arbitrators, independence and impartiality obligations for arbitrators, mechanisms for challenging arbitrators, mechanisms for choosing the arbitral seat if the BAT didn't do it, which it could, and mechanisms for choosing the language of the arbitral procedure and a basic outline of, of arbitral procedures. And therefore, in answer to the first of, of the buts that one might adopt or, or think about in the context of a bilateral arbitration treaty, this the mechanism could provide for precisely the same certainty, precisely the same predictability and procedural regularity as all the arbitration agreements that are routinely enforced every single day of the year, every single year of the decade. And so that's not really much of an objection. Indeed, the bilateral arbitration treaty could go beyond um, the UNCTRAL arbitration rules. For example, if the two states wanted to specify a default seat um, 
Tonga and New Zealand might, for example, pick Singapore because it's in the region or Australia or, or somewhere else um, if, if they so desire. They could choose a language as a, as a default language and, and address other aspects of, of the arbitral procedure. So what about, what, what, what are the other buts that, that one could imagine? The second, the second but would be this, this is not just contrary to the, the basic ethos of, of international arbitration, but indeed contrary to the basic ethos of, of private international law itself. It denies party autonomy. You are imposing on parties this arbitral mechanism when they haven't, they haven't agreed to it. And that, that of course, isn't, isn't true if, if you listen carefully to what I've said, because this is a default mechanism. It is a mechanism that applies when the parties haven't otherwise agreed, but it leaves the parties entirely free to agree otherwise. If parties, for example, want to have their disputes resolved in New Zealand courts or the courts of Tonga, they would be perfectly free to include form selection clauses in, in their contract and, and contract out of the bilateral arbitration treaty. Or they could agree to a different form of arbitration. They could, for whatever reason, agree to ICC arbitration in, in Paris or somewhere instead of the default mechanism under the bilateral arbitration treaty. Or they could just plain opt out of the bat entirely, a little bit the way parties opt out of the CISG. Um, they would simply exclude its terms from their contractual relationship. And so in answer to the objection that bilateral arbitration treaties contradict party autonomy, that's not true. Um, it preserves party autonomy. It just provides a different and better default dispute resolution mechanism. So this third but is, okay, you're, you're getting a little bit of traction with us, but what about regulatory space? It's sort of the mantra of the decade. Aren't you interfering with states' regulatory authority? Answer to that, no, of course not. Um, this is international commercial disputes, firstly. This is not investment disputes. It might be usable for investment disputes, but these are ordinary contractual disputes between businesses. And if states have particular areas that they want really badly to regulate, outside the arbitral process. I don't think that'd be a good idea, but if they did, nothing in the New York Convention and nothing in the BAT would prevent them from doing so, either through specific exclusions, for example, consumer arbitration, which by the way isn't covered by the basic concept of the BAT, which is business to business, or antitrust or securities regulations. If states wanted those sorts of disputes to be non-arbitrable, they would be free to identify those disputes or alternatively, just the way the New York Convention works with the non-arbitrability exception and the public policy exceptions to both recognition of arbitration agreements and, and arbitral awards, states regulatory space, their sovereign authority to regulate things that they think are really important would be preserved entirely. This doesn't have anything to do, the concept of a bilateral arbitration treaty doesn't have anything to do with consumers, with employment dispute, with domestic relations disputes. It's just business to business and with respect to those aspects of business to business disputes that states wanted to opt out to, to carve out of the, the terms of the bat, they would be free to do so. Okay, what about, why bother? What about the notion businesses are already free by virtue of the New York Convention to contract for international commercial arbitration? If they want to do so, the New York Convention allows them to do so. Why do we need to provide a default solution for them? And that's a serious question, but it's also one that when you think about it, shouldn't detain us in thinking harder and further about bilateral arbitration treaties. We all know, all of us that practice international arbitration know how full the law books are of pathological arbitration clauses. We also know how frequently cases involving pathological arbitration clauses or no arbitration clause at all don't even make it into the law books. Unfortunately, arbitration clauses are frequently the thing that businesses think about at 11.59 when the deal's about to close. They usually don't devote the attention and care to those provisions that they might. And as a consequence, they either leave out arbitration clauses within, when in fact international arbitration is precisely the sort of dispute resolution they want as compared to the alternatives, or they put in a pathological 
arbitration clause. This is particularly, maybe even uniquely true for small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and by definition, in a sense, businesses from small states. The, the real question I would suggest is, which is a better form, default form, of international commercial dispute resolution in today's world? International commercial arbitration, enjoying the enforceability benefits of the New York Convention or a bilateral arbitration treaty on the one hand, or national court proceedings on the other hand. And I would suggest the answer to that is very clear. I think before we think about the answer to that, though, I think, I think we ought to try to make a little bit more pointed the criticism of bilateral arbitration treaties, which would be, if one wanted harshly to critique it, it's a denial of justice in a sense. It denies parties access to national courts when they haven't agreed to opt out of that. Access to justice, access to a public court is fundamentally important. It's a basic civil right, a constitutional right in many jurisdictions. You can't, you shouldn't take that away from a party when it hasn't agreed. That's just wrong when you think about it in the international context. Because in the international context, you're not talking about access to a court. That, that metaphor, that slogan sounds wonderful in a domestic setting where you would be denying a party access to a court system. In an international setting, you're not denying parties access to a court. You're by definition denying them access to at least two courts, two countries' sets of courts, in which each party, the world being what it is in international business, inevitably has resort to its own home courts for good and sufficient reasons. Parallel proceedings ensue with two sets of lawyers being paid, not one, with jurisdictional form selection and other disputes being happily um, pursued by the lawyers and less happily paid for by the clients. And then best of all, the ultimate judgments, no doubt in favor of each party in its respective home jurisdiction, then being unenforceable because there is, as I said, no global convention on national court judgment recognition. At the end of the day, that's not access to justice. That's a denial of justice. The bilateral arbitration treaty, like the New York Convention, actually provides more effectively, if what you want is access to justice, access to a fair, neutral, expert, efficient, and ultimately enforceable means of resolving disputes. That, if you care about access to justice, is what you want to want. That's what you should want, not the traditional shibboleth of access to local courts. Local courts may make lots of sense in domestic proceedings. In an international proceeding, almost by definition, they can't make the same sort of sense. In any event, for all those reasons, we come to the final but. The final but is nobody's adopted a bilateral arbitration treaty yet. It's new, it's untested. That was true 60 years ago or so of the New York Convention in 1958, as I said. Nobody had adopted that revolutionary instrument and it took them a while. It took them, as I've said, 50, 60 years to get to where we currently are. But fear of the unknown isn't actually a particularly good reason to keep denying people access to justice. And this is a solution, I think, that is uniquely well tailored to small states who can't afford, don't have the human, financial, other resources to create, participate in international tribunals, international court systems. It provides a mechanism by which they can ensure their businesses access to the global economy in an efficient way. Um, and I think I've managed now to find my way to the end of my talk. I hope it's been um, enlightening. Um, I'd be happy, I think I'm allowed to take questions. I'd be happy to take questions, if there are any. I'm sorry? Do you want to manage the questions yourself? Uh, sure, I'll manage the questions. It looks like an easy job. <laughs> uh, in the back on the right. Oh, hi. Hi. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very much. Um, Gary um, did something for us in Tonga, and we'd like to bring him back. 
<laughs> so I'm looking at August, so I'd like to talk to you later about that. But a quick question. Um, what I had in mind is I think the proposal about having a bilateral arbitration treaty may be interesting, but um, wouldn't it be better if we were to have regional, considering that almost all countries, or now that's the norm, we have a lot of countries concluding, because we, if it is bilateral, we may end up with four or 5,000 such agreements, as, assuming that it catches on. Mm. So I would have thought that if we could extend it, it will be easier. So yeah. for example, if you have a group of countries negotiating a regional trade agreement, it would only be natural for them to have um, maybe included as part of the agreement. And that would obviate the need of having a lot of you know um, such um, agreements. Yeah, that's actually an excellent question, or or sort of set of questions, um, and and I've 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 given some thought to that in in other contexts, and actually come up with a new name. Um, instead of bats, it can be mats, multilateral arbitration treaties. Um, but 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 the the comment actually has I, I think two pieces to it. One. It, wouldn't it make more sense for this proposal to be multilateral on the one hand as opposed to, to bilateral on the other hand? That's, that's part of the observation. And the second part of the observation is wouldn't it make sense for this to be part of a broader um, treaty arrangement, a free trade agreement, something along those lines? And I, and I, think, on, I think both of those observations are, are highly perceptive and, and at least in, in the context of, of some regions of the world, um, exactly correct. I think there are obvious efficiencies to be gained from having a multilateral arrangement, especially if, if there are a number of smaller states in a particular region. There are obvious benefits um, in terms of language and, and cultural similarities and regional integration um, from piggybacking the, the notion of a bat or a mat on, on a free trade agreement. Um, it may make it slightly more complicated because, because bigger negotiations are always more complicated than, than smaller negotiations, but I still, I, I, I think the, the observation is, is exactly right. And more importantly, um, I, think, I think it's really a question for states to decide if, if states in a region, um, whether the Caribbean or the South Pacific or Latin America or Southeast Asia, wherever, um, thought it made sense. Um, there is nothing inherent in the concept of, of an arbitration treaty, a default arbitration mechanism for international commercial dispute resolution that would prevent it from being used in multilateral contexts as well as, as bilateral contexts. So I think it's a great set of, of observations. I think there was a question here, right in the middle. What you'd have to say um, to those people who would like the recent um, member of the judiciary in the UK that um, taking um, commercial disputes um, so systematically out of the courts will have an effect, a, a negative effect on the common law. Mm. And if that doesn't have a um, particular resonance in small states, when, you know, oftentimes when um, advising clients on the law of ex jurisdiction, it, the answer is uh, there is no law. Mm. So I wonder what, what sort of effect it would have on the development of the court system and the actual substantive law, which ultimately will be applied by arbitrators. Yeah, that's a it's a two part question in in a sense. And if I can translate it, the first part of the question is why is Lord Thomas so hopelessly wrong, and then the second part of the question is might he nonetheless um, have some. Um, might his criticisms nonetheless have some traction in the context of, of small states. Lord Thomas is hopelessly wrong, um, as, as many others um, have, have said, because firstly, the number of um, commercial cases in English courts haven't, haven't gone down, um, but, but have gone up. There are more than enough complicated commercial disputes, complicated international commercial disputes to feed what someone has called the Minotaur, um, and produce lots of common law decisions for better or for worse and to ensure that judges get to, to continue to, to develop the law. I'm also struck to some extent by the notion that the, the, the reason that um, one has law ultimately, I would have thought, um, is, is to enable parties to resolve their disputes. Owen Fiss, a, a Yale law professor, once wrote a seminal article that Lord Thomas must have, have been reading called Against Settlement. And his proposition was that parties shouldn't be permitted, actually, to settle their cases because in doing so, they deprive 
um, the public of the public good of published court decisions. At the end of the day, I thought always, um, and I think most businesses, I think frankly most citizens would agree that law ought to enable parties consensually to resolve their disputes between themselves, whether through mediation and conciliation on the one hand, or through just old-fashioned settlement discussions on the other hand. And the notion that disputes are there to make law, as opposed to law being there to resolve disputes, I think is fundamentally misconceived. It, it I think, contradicts the one of the most basic notions of, of private autonomy and, and on some level civil rights that, that we have. And so I don't, in fact, have much sympathy for Lord Thomas's suggestions about drastically curtailing the efficacy of international commercial arbitration in, in this country. Um, more fundamentally, um, when you think about how a bilateral arbitration treaty might be structured, there's nothing that would prevent, A, the arbitral proceedings pursuant to the BAT being public and the awards being public. And B, if the awards were not public, public in the sense of um, actually completely transparent arbitral proceedings, if that's the default mechanism, then at least redacted versions of the awards could be public. That would ultimately provide a source of law that all of the states that were parties to the multilateral arbitration treaty could draw on. And presumptively, if, if you've accepted the premises of this form of dispute resolution being more expert because it's chosen by the parties and genuinely neutral instead of somebody's home court, provide a better, not a worse source of law. If what one wanted actually was to generate good, expert international commercial law, then this mechanism with some form of public access to the awards would provide a better source of law, not a less good source of law. And I should note that a very substantial number of the decisions that are rendered under the CISG are actually arbitral awards not surprisingly, and that those arbitral awards drive to substantial, in substantial part, the interpretation and development of law under the, the Vienna Convention on, on the International Sale of Goods. And I, I see no reason the same sort of thing couldn't, couldn't occur in the context of a bilateral arbitration treaty. I think we've got time for one more question. Tony. with those who criticize international commercial arbitration. The criticism is uh, centered on ICSID type arbitration, but the, the criticisms cross over. <coughs> Stephen Schwebel in <coughs> earlier this year wrote uh, an interesting article commenting on the EU's reaction to uh, the American position in the attempted treaty across the Atlantic. Uh, rejecting the idea, as Europe has done, of uh, arbitration as the dispute resolution mechanism and proposing some freestanding uh, judicial body to deal with disputes under that treaty if it ever gets agreed. Stephen Schwebel described the criticism, which is based largely on concerns about attacking the sovereign state sovereignty. Uh, as follows, an attack not from the reactionary right, but from a melange of academics, some eminent, by labor union spokesmen, by others antagonistic to globalization, such as the Greens, by well-meaning critics. It doesn't mean they're right. And he says, Stephen Schwebel said, in my view, they're largely and profoundly wrong. The reason I raise it is because it isn't just uh, uh, that group of people who are criticizing and attacking the idea of arbitration for a whole variety of reasons, but it's extended, as indeed as Stephen Schwebel said in a footnote to his piece, that this um, attack is actually very considerable. The Economist uh, said uh, in 2014, the implementation of the laudable idea, that is of international commercial arbitration as a means of resolving these types of disputes, has been disastrous. It's become so controversial it threatens to scupper trade deals and so on and so on. Question for you is, how do we deal with this? Because uh, 
you would agree, I would agree, lots of people would agree, and this field would agree, but there is a, a very significant movement out there attacking the very idea of what are seen as private tribunals. You, you'll be familiar with the attacks made in New Zealand prior to the uh, final agreement by New Zealand uh, for the uh, Pacific Treaty, and arbitration is embedded in that. But the, it's extended to the point where it has taken all 28 or whatever it is members of the EU to reject the concept. Uh, there's a story in here of cab drivers in Berlin who, when someone gets into their cab, says, I'm against international state arbitration. <laughs> how, how, how do we deal, deal with that? The, the first thing, that's an that's a excellent set of, of, of observations. Both Sorry, too much of a speech, but you see No, no, no. It's a, it's a great opportunity, actually. Challenges are always opportunities. Um, I, I think, firstly, although there has been some, if I can put it this way, crossover, those criticisms are overwhelmingly relevant to and directed at investor state arbitration. They do not concern international commercial arbitration in its traditional form arising out of negotiated agreements between private businesses. They are focused in particular on the admittedly challenging task of arbitral tribunals deciding issues touching directly on state sovereignty through the mechanism of legal rules such as fair and equitable treatment protections against expropriation, and the like. Those sorts of disputes which one has in investment arbitration are peculiarly difficult. They always have been. They were difficult before investment arbitration began, and these sorts of disputes were resolved through diplomatic espousal of claims. And they've been difficult since bilateral investment treaties and, and the exit convention with, with more than 156 contracting parties was adopted. None of those criticisms, save in the most diluted form, concern traditional international commercial arbitration. That's, that's my first, first observation. Second observation. I think there has been a huge degree of distortion about what international investment arbitration is. And it is therefore no surprise that the poor taxi cab driver has been so misled. One has heard, for example, that investment arbitration isn't transparent. That might have been true once, because that was what states wanted then. But it's not true anymore, at least with regard to those states that do want transparency. Whether it is the UNCTRAL transparency rules on the one hand, or the Mauritius Convention on the other, or the transparency provisions in the NAFTA on the third hand mechanisms to ensure that if what states want is open public arbitral proceedings in investment disputes, they can do it. Therefore, criticism about um, transparency, I think, is, and, and that, I, I start with that because to some extent I think that is what one very frequently hears from, from taxi drivers and, and from the notion of, of, of private tribunals. One also hears the notion that, that, that investor state arbitration is inevitably tilted against the state and that arbitrators are frequently subject to conflicts of interest, belong to our members of, of large law firms or have private backgrounds which thereby incapacitates them from deciding disputes neutrally. I think anyone who has had experience in any way with investment arbitration knows that that isn't true. Arbitrators are subject to strict rules of impartiality and independence, which are administered with huge diligence and, and competence by arbitral institutions, ICSID, the World Bank, other arbitral institutions of, of equal standing. And when arbitrators lack independence and impartiality, they are disqualified. There are arbitrators who, um, on, on both sides of, of the investor state um, divide, if, if I can put it that way, who, who sit frequently and bring a high degree of expertise to, to what they do. Um, if one looks carefully at the results that investor state tribunals have arrived at, one sees that the notion of some sort of investor bias is, is completely wrong. In about a third of all cases, um, claims are, 
investors' claims are entirely dismissed. In about a third of all cases, investors' claims are upheld, but almost invariably, indeed, I think I can safely say invariably, with very, very substantial discounts out off the amounts claimed. And then finally, for me, the most important and, and to some extent most interesting third of, of the equation is a third of all disputes are, are settled consensually. The state agrees to pay some money or take some steps to ensure that the investor is protected against the violation of its, its rights that the state in settling the dispute acknowledges. And I think a mechanism that provides that sort of, of end result isn't, isn't one to be criticized, but is in fact, as, as Steve Schwebel suggested, one of the shining examples over the last four decades of international law actually working. And I would be loath, I would be very loath um, to break something that works, to try to fix something that frankly isn't very broken. One has adopted, one has seen the adoption of a number of, of important reforms to improve the process, which is a good thing, but to um, attempt to um, do away with, with arbitration in the context of investment dispute resolution, I think would, would be a tragic mistake. It is also, I think, unfortunately, um, an attitude towards arbitration that has a history that it's sometimes useful to remember. Um, when the French Republic overthrew the monarchy in the constitution of year one, they included an article that guaranteed the right of the citizens to resolve their disputes by arbitration. And the new republic used that to resolve disputes with its citizens and allowed its citizens to resolve disputes between themselves in that way. Along came Napoleon. He had a different view of the world, not a view in the world in which free and equal citizens resolve disputes under the rule of law, but instead a state-centered view of the world where the state resolves everything. And therefore, in the Napoleonic Code, arbitration was effectively prohibited for the next century until the Geneva Protocol in the 1920s. It wasn't just France that had a history like that, that ought to give us pause, but Germany too, with Germany, I think actually, whether it's the Berlin cab driver or otherwise being at the heart of the EU court proposals. And in Germany, through the Hanseatic League and the Prussian Civil Code, arbitration was encouraged. It was encouraged until the 1930s. The National Socialists took a different view. They adopted something called the Reich Guidelines on Arbitral Tribunals, which forbid the use of arbitration in contracts with state and discouraged it in contracts between private parties because they saw arbitration. They saw dispute resolution between free and equal citizens by decision makers that they had chosen as a threat in their words to the national socialist vision of the state. Their vision of the state was that it should decide everything, that individuals shouldn't decide anything because their being able to decide things threatened the state. I worry as I listen to the criticisms of arbitration, whether it's from the Berlin cab driver or other parts of the EU, that we're going backwards, not forward. We're going back to a vision of the world that doesn't really respect the rule of law, doesn't really look to trying to resolve disputes under the rule of law, and instead has a different vision. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. I think I've probably gone on too long, uh, but it was a good ending, no? Thank you. It was a fantastic ending, and I think like every good keynote it made had three themes. One, reminding us what we've talked about before the keynote, one foreshadowing what we're going to talk about this afternoon, and one completely new thoughts.